Hi. I know you signed up for a video that promising is a lot of hands-on coding examples and me just sharing my console doing things. And today we just look on a whiteboard and I will write some stuff on the whiteboard. It sounds a little bit like school and it's a bit like school, but this course is about some foundations and some foundations are easier to show if you see some kind of connections in between how it basically evolves. And before we really write some tracking setups, before we develop some tracking plans and so on, I think it makes sense to, to understand how the different kind of pieces come together and why, for example, it is a good idea to have a plan. Of course, like you can just start do it without plan, but I make a case where a plan can really help you. And I hope this kind of way, how I explain it, makes it easier for you to get an idea how to create this kind of plan. And I will also show some approaches how you can design these kind of plans from, from a, let's say, philosophy and schema-based approach. So what is the best way to do this? And I will explain why I choose a specific kind of approach over another one. And if you finish this one, it should give you, first of all, a good idea where a plan really helps you. Second of all, an idea how to design a plan, at least from a high level structure and principle. So how to do it in detail, we will do in the hands-on sessions. And finally, to really get an understanding, what are the different kinds of data events that you can collect within your company or your project or whatever you used it for. And I hope you get these kind of takeaways by the end. And without further ado, let's jump into our session. All you need to know about the theory of data collection, at least the, let's say, why we do data collection in a specific kind of way, because in a simple way, data collection is super simple. So you have somewhere a place where all the data can land. And then you just pop this one in and pop this one in, and then you pop this one in and yeah, you get the data from all the different kinds of sources. And so this is some kind of storage somewhere. And this can be a data lake, this can be a database. This can be a third party tool. For example, oops, come on. I don't want this one. No, not this one. Okay. For example, just looking for a specific kind of character like Google Analytics or it's like, I don't know, Tableau, which is built on top of the database, anything, but you just drop the stuff in there. In the end, it's a little bit like how to say it's a bit random. This could be like. Oops, so move down a bit. So this could be web tracking data. This could be data from your production database. And as you can see, so all these kind of data comes in specific kind of shapes. And what you do right now is really you just randomly also for instance here I'm And so what you just do, you just dump everything into this kind of place. In the end, this is often the setup where most of the people start to some degree. In the world where I'm coming from, most of them start here. They just implement some web tracking and they take the standards and then they extend it a little bit because they have a specific kind of question and so on. It's really like the, it's like the exploring mode of data, which I think for the start is totally fine. but at some point, you really need to know what kind of things you really want to need and what do you want to achieve. In the end, you have a goal why you spend these kind of hours to implement all these kind of things. And in the end, just to know, web tracking, for example, tells you someone clicked this button. The production database maybe tells you someone changed their settings. 
the CRM data tells you someone opened their email. What does it tell you? And this is often like the problem that in most of the setups is also like the problem why data is so complicated within a company. It's because the gap to what the data is collecting, so someone clicked a button, to someone is doing a daily job in your business and their daily job is not about people clicking buttons. If it's the right button, maybe yes, because this person, for example, works in marketing. So for them, it's important to know when a purchase has happened. And so if someone clicks the order submit button, for them, this is an important button click, but maybe not just the button click, but maybe the confirmation which comes after the button. Everyone in your company works on specific kind of tasks. And these tasks are often not the kind of raw state that you get the first kind of data in your system. So they have to translate it. Of course, if you have training with it, okay, if I have a click event CTA button and this click event even then, I know from context of the page, this must be the order confirmation. Yeah, of course, I can derive my information, which is useful for me by that. But it requires me to do some kind of brain work to translate it. And as I already said, my job is not to translate data into things. My job usually is like to run some kind of campaigns. And for me, it's in data, we get better when we really get better to closing this bridge where people don't have to translate so much. Because another thing that can also happen, and it happens quite often, is you translate it wrong. You assume that this kind of button click is actually the order submit, but it's not. It's something different because... I don't know, people made a mistake or you just interpret the context in the wrong way. So you always assume that this is your conversion event, but it's not. So translation creates errors and misunderstanding. And that's why we need a different approach. And because in the end, what are, like the, what are the questions? Let's put it like this. What is really important? Really important are the different kind of business questions that the different people in your company ask themselves every day. So for example, the most obvious question, how is our business performing? Or related from that, based on what kind of person you are, if you are the CEO and you're in a startup, do we get the next founding round? If you are an employee in a startup, do I have my job the next month? If you are a marketing person in this kind of company, do I met my goals that we defined at the beginning of the year? So this is a very relevant, this is a very relevant business question. And can you answer them with button clicks? Maybe, but we have to find out how to come from here to here. I don't know. So another question could be like, how is our product used? Because you want to know, okay, we have a subscription and what are do people who subscribe, what do they do compared to people who don't subscribe? So is there some kind of magic formula within our product that makes some people successful and other people not? So this would be interesting to know. And maybe if you are in marketing, of course, like you want to know, which are my best growth channels? And growth channels mean these are channels who create really good leads. On the one hand, these are channels who are not too expensive to create these kind of leads, or it's still okay. The, the whole formula works up. And most important, these are growth channels that if I put another $10,000 in this kind of channel, they send me the same kind of people over. So I have something if I want to plan my next year, I can say, yeah, we just invest here and this is the outcome we can expect. This is quite great if you can get something like this. But these are like the important questions that you ask yourself. The problem is to answer these questions, you have to collect the right data in the right shape. And this sounds really great. And then everyone is like nodding their heads. Yes, of course, right data, right shape. But the big question is really how do you get there? So you have, I don't know, I wanted to really do this kind of, no, it's not possible. Okay, how do you get there? 
where people often start, and this is definitely already an improvement to the first approach where we, so first approach is we dump everything here. And it's good, as I said, like it's the experimentation phase. We just get new to it. But now we maybe go to the next level and we have these kind of questions. And so maybe the first thing that we think about is not define some metrics. And so this is like what I call the metrics based approach. And so this could be like that you say, Hey, actually we are super interested in our customer acquisition costs per channel, because this helps us to answer, which are my best growth channels. It doesn't answer everything because like, maybe we also need to know, okay, um, I don't know, potential at market size. Are we just scratching at the 1% and if we spend another million, we get a lot of more. And this is something that you might calculate as well. And yeah, you could start to derive everything from that. And so you could see, okay, what do I need to, to calculate the customer acquisition cost? And this brings you down to a lot of different kind of metrics. And I definitely tell you at some point, this is a really good exercise to do that. So for example, yeah, you need costs. And then of course you need some kind of conversion event, because if not, you would not know how much cost can pile up until someone becomes a customer. And so you have to know when someone becomes a customer and so on. So this is definitely a good approach, but I would not start to use it to create your data collection strategy because of course you have to collect the data that in the end brings you all these kind of metrics and enables you. But if you do this, it's a highly abstract exercise. And if you are really experienced with data setups, it's something you can definitely achieve because you have built these kind of things before. And so you know how to get from a very high level and different kind of areas like metrics down to what kind of data you need to collect. If you do this for the first time, it's a super hard exercise. And usually something which can left you pretty frustrated and sometimes maybe not even like with the same best results to do. Just need to make a quick break. So what works better, at least for me and from my experience also like for teams who, I don't know, haven't built their 20th data stack is more like a business and product based approach. And so what does that mean? It means basically that let's make these errors again, let's go here. It means that you basically create a map of your business. So in the end, what you do is like you create, let's call it a little bit like a storage plan. And in the storage plan, you map out, so let's build a little bit like this. So you map out the different kind of, let's say, business areas that you're in. And I do this by mapping out business objects. So don't go into this way to map out business teams. This is something that, yes, it's also an approach. So marketing does the data stuff for them. Product does the data stuff uh, for itself. But it creates a lot of problems because in the end, of course, like it, it works to some kind of degree, but the problem is like you have often like your business is not that you are just do marketing alone. So of course, like there are interactions. And so you create these typical team silos that in the end are not super helpful to, to work with. And so what I recommend instead is to break up your business into your different business objects. And so business objects, so let's assume a software as a service company. And so in the other videos, we go into more and more in details to really show. So right now we just, I just want to give you an idea. We might have an account that people create. And so then we also might have a subscription that some people create. And um, it might also be that we have sessions because people go into our tool and do something. So let's assume these three. And within these, let's say business objects, we have different kinds of activities that people do. So for example, people create an account because if they don't create it, it will not work for them. So we have this created thing. 
then maybe they upgrade. No, no, upgrade we put in a subscription. So maybe they update their account. But this is very generic. So let's say they enhance their accounts. Enhance means so they provide specific as information, which basically makes it for us, yeah, better to work with this kind of data. Subscription also can be created. Here it's a bit easier because these are really like standard events. So it can be renewed or can be canceled. Sessions can be started. And they can finish successfully, which is something we have to define. But the interesting thing is what you can see here is like, so let's put this a little bit of different structure. So we basically built Let's say it's a floor plan of your of our business data production plan. And so the interesting thing is now when some kind of data arrives, so let's so there's coming some new data. So for example, there's coming some data. This so there comes some data. And this is a subscription. Subscription created activity and this for example comes from your subscription management tool because this is where you create most of the subscriptions and besides you just dump the data somewhere in your data lake within let's say a table which is called so let's be it let's make it. this could be stripe and in the old approach, you would have a table here somewhere sitting around called Stripe, and then you just dump the data here. What we do instead is, so we receive the data from Stripe, this is fine, but then we make sure that the data basically is landing here. So it basically lands in our, let's say, in the sessions, or not in the section, okay, now we have to put it here, right? So we make sure that the data ends up in the right place because we want to end it up in the subscription session. And we want to make sure that within the subscription session, it ends up here and created. Another interesting thing is this subscription created activity could also trigger something else, uh, which means it could also, for example, there might be use cases where people don't have an account yet, but they already buy a subscription. So sometimes in enterprise things, you have this. So you buy a bulk of subscription and someone comes there, don't have an account, but you already activate the subscription and afterwards they get an account. Or, and because you don't have integrated it, as a first place, you basically put the, this trigger that a subscription has been created can also just create an activity here where you say, okay, this actually also creates an account. And so then, for example, you say the source is like the subscription tool, but it basically has the same. The good thing is this is like the same trigger, but it creates two different kinds of activities, but in the right context. So here in an account and here in a subscription, which makes it then easy for you to, if you want to make a reporting about how many accounts has been created, to have everything in the right place and you don't really have to see, okay, these are the 95% of normal created account, but I know from someone that it also happens that when a subscription has been created, that there could be a, a account created too, but I cannot really distinguish it because I don't know where which subscription also created an account, so I have to create a difference. Super, I don't know, doesn't really make sense. There's a lot makes sense. The basic principle is you sketch out how your business works. You basically make your, let's say, business production floor plan where you have all the different kind of business objects that are around in your business. And you basically have all the different kind of activities. And once some data arrives, you put it in the right place. So you already have an order in place. So you already have a storage order in place where you want to get the things end up. Because the nice thing is, if you have this in place, and you say, okay, actually Stripe is not my deliverer of subscription stuff anymore. 
because I basically put something on top like ChargeB, and now ChargeB is delivering the thing, it doesn't really make a huge difference for you. So in the end, you just have to make sure when ChargeB is delivering your subscription created thing that it ends up in the same place. But you don't really have to change any kind of dashboards on top. So you don't have to change a lot of data modeling on top. The data already arrives in the right shape, the shape that you define, in the right place. And this is, I can tell you, this saves you a ton of money and sanity and brain power in the end. So it's, it's a really nice tool to, to approach this. And the reason why I prefer the business and product-based approach over the metric one is of course all these things down here at some point will create some kind of metrics and you can drive and define and normalize metrics on top of the good thing about this business and product-based approach is like it's a lot easier for everyone in your company to define this because you are the experts on your business and you are the experts on your product so for you sketching out these different kind of things is super easy if you just bring all the different kind of people from your company into one room and let them work on that. And, and I, we show in different kind of courses what you can use to create these kind of things. But it's a much closer to you to work with this. And so you usually, I, you can expect because you know your business and your product, uh, you can be pretty sure that you come up with the right structure. And the good thing is since business change so often, of course, like sometimes you make a bigger turnaround in your business, but usually business stays pretty static over time, at least like with the business objects you are working with. This stays pretty static too. So once you have this floor plan in place, it stays like this and it works and it represents the business. One of the things that I really learned is like when we started to use this kind of structure, and we got different kind of people in these kind of sessions. So we had CEOs, we have CTOs, we have developers, we have marketing people, we have sales people, we have product people. Everyone is speaking the same language. And this was such a game changer for me that when I started to do these kind of sessions, I got everyone with the same knowledge and the same rights at the table and they could just discuss how basically the different kind of objects work, what kind of activity are happening there. And so, of course, like if you talk about uh, some uh, entities which are more closer to the sales team can contribute a lot more. But sometimes you even have things that are not really like in the sales team because maybe all the operation part that is connected to sales but not in sales. And so if you bring all these people together, you create a map of your business which is really great. And if you then put just the, the data to your business map, let's put this over here so that we don't forget it. This is basically your business map. So if you put the data in the places that you define on your business map, it also makes it easier for people to understand where they find the right data. Because then they don't have to apps do some abstract data things and that was there in place. So they, you just say, okay, actually you can find all the new subscriptions in this kind of table which you can find in this kind of data set but you have to filter it down by blah 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 and so on so it you make it really easy to access this kind of data for everyone because you speak business language in this kind of approach all right and if you compare this to we just had in the beginning to this this is easy to set up this is a bit harder to set up because you have to spend a lot of more time to planning. But in the end, you want to get the data out and you want to work with this. So this part here becomes a lot easier than in the approach up top where like dumping everything is easy. I always have this example like you want to build uh, a house and you have a construction site. And like in the first example, people just... I don't know, you, you order different kind of things. And so they bring a lot of things to build, let's say, a roof. And they bring everything they thought of because you don't really give them clear instructions. You just say, I want to build a roof. And so they don't really know what you need. Do you, I don't know, need specific kind of wood? Are you preferring a specific kind of chimney? So whatever. So they bring everything they have and just dump it on your yard. And then you have to sort through and have to figure out what, what works for you, what not. For a small thing where you have to explore things, it works. But for a big project, it doesn't work. So it's a lot better if you really tell them, okay, actually, I need this kind of type of wood. I need it in this kind of shape. 
And, and I want to maybe just deliver it next to where I built those things and you don't dump it like down the road where it's more convenient for you. So you can please drive up and bring it where we want to work because we want to get it quickly done. And so this is the same. So this is why you do this business map. So I guess what we are now is like, we are ready for the plan. I hope I convince you that it makes sense. So we are ready for the business map, which basically is like the plan that we want to sketch out. And so to do this, how to approach this kind of plan. And so I hinted it a little bit how I approach it, but there are different ways. And I at least want to basically map out one approach that is quite popular and it's around for quite some time and a lot of people base their first data collection thing on this kind of thing. And I call it the segment object and action plan. So I put a link in the show notes that you can have a look on this or, or maybe you already came across this kind of post. So segment at some point created a post that was, I would say, maybe one of the most popular posts in the data community. Because I think, or most shared posts in the data community, because they basically did a breakdown how you can create a good tracking plan. So let's put it here, tracking plan. And why was it shared? Because first of all, no one really had an idea to create a good tracking plan. And the good thing about the segment model, it's really quite simple. And it makes sense in a lot of places and it makes things definitely easier. And so what they did is, okay, if you have a tracking event, you usually have a combination of object and action. So these go together. How you want to define it, it's up to you. You can also do action object. So in the end, how you do it semantically, it's really up to you. So usually I stick with, let's say, sign up. Come on, sign up, finished. Or some people just did finished, sign up. All good. There is definitely no preference. Segment then also brought in that maybe you should put it in past tense because when you track an event, it already has happened. And so it's all good. It all makes sense. And just put this here. What you also get is then you get all these little tiny little properties, properties that you just put to this event because this object action combination creates an event for you. Event. And so this is like the event here. I'll make it a bit smaller. So this is the event. Sign up, finished, finish sign up, whatever. And then you can have different kind of properties. For example, you can be like sign up method, which could be, for example, Google sign in. Sign in. Or I don't know. Sign up is not something that creates so many properties maybe sign up place or no sign up place for example you can sign up at different kind of places within the app or sign up dot placement so that you have different kind of buttons where people can start their sign up and so this for example could be like in the navigation so you can see the properties bring all the kind of context into this thing and what's cool about this so let's take some greens for the plus section What's really great about this kind of approach is it's super easy. It's easy to understand. You can explain it to anyone and everyone immediately gets some kind of idea. It's also, I would say it also already implements a very, at least a really good abstraction because it tells you that you should use the properties to create context because with this sign up start placement where I put navigation in, I could also call it sign up finished from navigation. So, and then I have six events for all the different kinds of places where I basically can start a sign up. They already introduced this kind of abstraction level that you put the context into the properties. That's definitely good. And so this is why I like this one. And it was really e like you already have an idea where to start because what people then did is they went through the application and looked like where can some interaction happen and then they say oh yeah this interaction is an event so great i just define this event based on this and it works really well this already also introduced a problem and this is like my biggest problem which i have with this kind of approach which i followed for some time as well is you have this interaction focus 
So you really go through, often really go through your interfaces or your platform, so like your website or your app, and you just go through and say, okay, here can something happen, here can something happen, you define everything. So you have this clear interaction focus. But first of all, not all this interaction is really relevant for you. So one of the problems that's happening here is you usually create too many events. So I saw setups where people have, I don't know, 600 events in the end. And this is why, because they followed this kind of approach, look like, okay, where can people do things? And most of them, it's really just noise. It's not really giving you a lot of signal data and, and it's hard to maintain and you create basically a mess. And, and you are missing, often you're missing what is working behind the scenes because they are clear, very, let's say, front-end driven applications, so be it like an online shop. So most of the stuff which is relevant for you happens when the user is doing things, yeah, on the online shop. But something might happen outside of it. For example, if you cancel an order, so this happening in your uh, administration system. And in software as a service, this, there are software as a services where a lot of things happening just behind the scenes and not really do you, the user usually just sees the end results or just sees something when something goes wrong, but still a lot of things are happening. And so like there, there are events shifting away from user interactions. And so these were often forgotten, forgotten in these kind of approaches because you, you were you, used to just go for the interactions that can happen. What you will see now is basically an updated version of the whole course. When I was originally recording it, I had a slightly different approach how I layer the different kind of events. So I was layering them with business, product, and interaction events. But for me, it became more clear that it's better and more precise to basically call the business events customer events, so like customer entity. Because in the end, like the, this will always be the, the core, the baseline of your whole business, whatever you do. And this is why it looks a little bit different. I still work on the same thing that I did before. So I will just jump off uh, on the mirror board that we are already started. But maybe if you have watched something else that I have created about this before, this might be the part that's a little bit different to the one that you already watched because I basically iterated the whole thing. Let's get into it. So the concept that I'm working with is basically I call the three-layer framework. And so the three-layer framework is basically like we break down our entities that we just described in the lesson before into customer, product, and interaction. And let's go through them step by step. So this makes it easy for you to understand what's the difference between them. The purpose of basically creating these three layers is to introduce a priority order and to make sure that you don't screw up tracking designs and tracking plans, especially, and we will talk about this in the interaction uh, category, especially with interaction events. Because if you introduce all interaction events into a tracking plan, you basically let it explode. So we come to that. Let's start with the customer, which is the easiest one. The customer entity is just one entity. And you basically, what you do is you define with the activities how a customer journey can look like. And yes, it can be that you have different kind of customer entities when your business is built like that. So for example, if you're a marketplace, you will have definitely two customer entities. And so this will be vendors and it will be buyers. So because both will have pretty different, different customer journeys. It's also okay to put everything under customer. So this is usually a point where I spend enough time to discuss with a lot of people how different these kind of groups are and if it really makes sense to basically aggregate everything under a one customer entity or if it's worth to basically break it out into two customer event entities. And there's no right and wrong answer. So in the end, I would say if you figure out because you have these different kind of scenarios into customers, and you have this different kind of steps, let's say, when it comes to activities that happen for a customer. So you end up with, let's say, 30 activities and both groups basically just share two or three. Break it up, definitely. If you see 80% is the same, just like 20% is different, keep it in one. And then just introduce a property of customer type. 
So the customer entity and activities basically represents the customer journey. And always make sure also like to find the, the, the right balance between high level and too granular. So of course you don't want to have a customer journey that is did onboarding step one, did onboarding step two. So yes, this that's too granular. So maybe you want to have something like finished onboarding, if this is important for you. If your onboarding are just some screens where someone clicks through, not important. Always think about this in customer journey activities, you basically define the activities where you build your investors management, and let's say really the highest level reports on, where you have to report these kind of numbers. So how many customers have created a new account, how many customers have started a subscription. So we are talking about this kind of level. So you will not tell anyone on a C level or on a board level how many onboarding steps someone has done because, yeah, who cares? The product cares. This is good. We come to this in a second. But this is like where, where you look at. So the, the level of, let's say, activities that you want. So if you end up with 20 customer activities, might be too many. So I would say rule of thumb, let's say 8 to 10 could be it depends a little bit how your customer journey looks like sometimes services are pretty complex and the customer journey can be longer because the whole customer journey is pretty long then it's fine when you have a little bit more but always keep in mind so it shouldn't be too many because the more you introduce the harder it gets to manage it and the cool thing about when you do this is basically the baseline in your data that everyone in your company understands because you can assume that everyone in your company has a quite good idea how a customer journey looks like. And if not, they at least immediately understand when you document the different kind of steps, what it is. So it's a very common language that your company is speaking of. And everyone who sees something like customer started a subscription immediately have an idea what it is. So. This is why I always introduce, and I have in all tracking designs, I have a customer entity, a set. Sometimes I break it up into uh, two. Sometimes it's totally fine to have just one and di differentiate between the types. And the same. The good thing is you can also then plan out all the properties around a customer. And this can be pretty extensive. So customer prop, let's say customer properties are, can be very telling because you will do a lot of slicing and dicing of the customer data. So it can be like, the, let's say, basic information, what plan they have, uh, maybe from which country and so on. But it can also be like uh, first marketing touch point. I don't know, submitted surveys, submitted the number of service tickets they create. So you can basically put all the context that is important for you to later understand the different kind of cohorts that you have. You can put into the properties. And it's good because you have a central place where you just define the one customer properties that make sense for you. So this is, I really like this customer thing. And if you start, just have time for one, just do this. So this already gives you a baseline how basically your business is working. The product level, product events. And I call them product events because mostly I work in spaces where we create products. A product can also be an online store. So. It does not stop there. If say, oh yeah, but we are service provider, then replace product with service. But in the end, it's the same. You have, will have different kind of assets, different kind of steps within your service that you provide where you can then do the same thing that you do right now for product as well. So the tricky thing about product events is that you don't get too granular. It's very tempting to make it pretty granular what kind of filter someone has clicked. And so we have another layer there, which is called the interaction layer. We come to this in a second. Always keep in mind, we still have an interaction layer. Always make sure that the activities, the entities and activities you define in this kind of layer, that they are high level enough that also like they will get into each, let's say, basic general product reporting. So. No one in a product reporting cares about what kind of filter has been collected, clicked in a list. Maybe there goes something in people who used a filter, this kind of cohort, how they perform against people who don't use it. But even this is pretty unlikely. So everything that is too specific for a specific kind of, let's say, 
characteristics of a feature, it doesn't belong here. So better really think, okay, what are the building blocks of your product? So from what kind of, let's say, objects, entities, your product is built off. If we take Jira, Jira will have users, they will have teams, they will have tickets, they will have views or boards, they will have workflows. That's it maybe. So of course not, Jira is much more powerful, but this is a good start. And so as you already saw, I just called it ticket. I didn't really say they have epics, they have tickets, they have subtasks, whatever, because like usually you just put it into tickets. So you, you can also find a more generic term for it. But it's important to, to keep this kind of high level. And so we have this example here, like the list. And so let's say is you are an online shop. And so a list is a very important asset for you because you will have plenty of lists. So you will have a list uh, when someone clicks on a category. You will have a list when someone is searching for something. But you also will have small list when you recommend similar pro uh, products, when you recommend add-ons and so on. So these are lists as well. So you have different kind of lists everywhere, but it totally makes some sense to aggregate everything under list. And here's pretty simple. A list can be viewed, it can be filtered, and just add another one, which I often split up. It's like it can be sorted as well. This is the kind of level that I'm talking of. And then the same. So like you, you define the properties for this entity which also makes it really powerful because you just define it once and then you reuse it in all the different kinds of places. And it might be that, let's say, for the related products, you will not use so many properties because it's not such a big list. You cannot basically filter it, but it's fine. Then you just have a small set, but you have the same set for the big list as well. It makes it pretty easy for you later to compare them and to bring them together. This is about product events. Now we come to the last one. The last one is very important. I will tell you why. Interaction, the interaction layer. I think this one gave me the hardest time because whenever I do a tracking design, and especially when we do this tracking design where we say, okay, we open up the website or the app, we go through and we, we define which kind of interaction of the users we want to track as events. And when you do this kind of approach, you usually like you do it in a team and there are a lot of people involved and everyone will see, sees this kind of approach. At some point, someone will come up, and this is like my classic example for it, shouldn't we track when someone is closing the layover? And then basically the room erupts in discussions. So there will be a group of people who say, actually, no, who cares? No one is, don't need this. And there will be some people who say, no, actually, it's important. We need to know which people basically cancel this kind of process. So you create basically a decision wheel of chaos because people cannot decide if it's important or not. And the interesting thing is it's both. It's totally not important for any kind of, let's say, high-level product reports, management reports, of course not. So there's a whole area where you work with the data, where no one cares how many people click on a close button of a layover. But there might be one product manager, or two, or one UX designer. For them, it's super important because they are responsible for this kind of feature. It doesn't make sense to tell them, actually, it's not important, because for them, it's extremely important. And they cannot do the job if they don't know it. You basically have two interests. And this is why I like to introduce this, this interaction layer. Because what I'm trying to do in the interaction layer is I want to do, I even changed it a little bit. So this was my early implementation. There are two ways to implement it. So one is you basically aggregate interactions in this very generic event structure. So this prevents that you create a lot of custom events so click the layover cross, click the layover close button, which in the end can easily produce 1,000 events. And then even some people are so adventurous that they say, yeah, we put this all in a tracking plan. This will never work. So what you try to do is like you try to include all these interactions in a more generic structure, but with enough context in the properties that makes it possible for this one PM who wants to analyze how many people are basically using this cross to shut down a layover to basically filter this out. 
out of this bigger pool of very, let's say, very different kind of interaction events. And so there are two ways to, I mean, there are two, some decisions you have to make. So how generic I do this? So you can go for this. So like that as an entity, you basically define the different kind of, the different kind of, let's say, interaction elements that you have. So it could be a CTA. It can be an icon. It can be a form. It can be a slideshow and so on. Or you even go a step further and I, I use both. I like this a little bit more because it's more speaking and it's usually easier for people to understand. But you can also go for interaction. And interaction is basically then a catch-all. And then interaction, for example, always has a type. And this type, for example, then is a CTA. So by that, if you just go for interaction and then you basically here and clicked, you basically define what kind of interaction are possible on this front end. If we talk about a web browser, then of course it's just clicked hovered if you want to track this but sometimes it might be important if you have work a lot with tooltips submitted and viewed there are some more but let's say this is like the basic set and the important thing happens here so for example let's take the cta example so you have an event called cta clicked and you bound this even so you can even like make sure, depending on how you implement it, so you're making sure that every CTA is clicked by this kind of event. And so what you do is you put the context here in the property. So you put the text from the CTA in there. You put the placement. So if it's possible for you to say, okay, this is basically in the second box on the landing page, put it there. Then you put the target, so where basically the CTA is pointing to, so which kind of URL is open afterwards. And then, of course, like you track the page. And so this can be extended even more. So enough context that someone later who looks like into all the CTA clicked event that they find the specific kind of event for the CTA they want to analyze. And so this is like the success metric to see, can people later find the thing? It is a little bit like auto tracking, but with a lot more control about it. And so, but it's really powerful because I don't want to call it like your catch all bucket, but to some degree it is like this. This is basically the layer where you serve this in individual cases. And there are even ways to automate this. And so there will be another course where we just look into how to build interaction layer events. And there we will also dive into how to basically automate it. Because implementing interaction events, no one likes this because it's so much work. So there are ways to do it more automatically and to do it in a, let's say, programmatic way so that you don't even have to think about to basically tag every CTA, but every CTA is tagged automatically. And this is something which I call explicit auto-tracking. And so this enables a lot of cool things because like it, you basically serve everyone. You serve the ones which are just look on the very important baseline metrics and work with them. And this will be like most of the product teams for most like product use cases management use cases, gross use cases. But you also support the single PMs and UX designers who need to understand how people are interact with filters, how people are going through a very long uh, form with all the different kind of input fields. So for them, this is important. And so you basically serve both without let someone suffer from the other. So this is why you separate both. Okay, so let's do a quick recap here. Let me zoom out a little bit. So what we did, so we started here. We started, we, we have this one place where we basically dump everything in there. This is how we usually approach tracking when we're just starting out. So we basically, we have this one place, let's be at a tool, let's be at a database, whatever. And we just, here, this is an event, just go in there. And the problem is like this kind of approach yeah, can work, but the problem is we have to know. Our questions are more like, okay, how is my business performing? How's my product performing? And so what are my best growth channels and so on? So our questions are totally different than the data we just dumped somewhere. So there's a huge gap in between. And so in the past, or like in, in classic tracking setups, we then go from the point where we collect all this massive kind of data, we try to get up to at some point reach a point where we can answer business and product questions. The problem with that is we don't do it in a good structure and we basically, yeah, create too many granular things that don't really work. 
So the better approach is really like to come from the other side to really see, okay, this is, so that's what we have here. We define how our business, how our product looks like. What are the different kind of entities our business is built of and especially our product and services built of and to define these. Because in the end, these are then the collection bu buckets where we can then point the data to. And this data can be collected from different kinds of places. But once we have this blueprint, how our product and our customers are basically, yeah, how they're behaving. When we have this, we can just point the data to the right place to this. And so everyone finds it in the right place. And this makes, this is a huge productivity boost to do this. And what we then looked into is like the segment approach to tracking, which is definitely a really good approach. And I think definitely a good starting point, but it can create some problems because like you basically start out to open up your application that goes through where can people interact, where can people do things and you define events based on that. And this is too much bound to how your front end work at the moment and not how in general your product and your service is working. And so we introduce this entity activity model where we basically come from the other side. We say, okay, this is how our customers are working. So this is how our product entities, so really high level building blocks, how your product is built off. And then we define activities within these building blocks. And then we define properties that describe this entity. And this makes it a lot easier because this whole concept is pretty static. So it will not change so much over time. So you define it once and you always work put the data then in the right place and you extend it slightly over time because this, this is how your business and product is evolving. So you just go with the evolving, but the evolving is super simple to do. It's just maybe one a new, new activity, two new properties, that's it. So this, is, this makes the whole process of implementation a lot easier. And then we broke down the entity into three layers. So the three layers are then like customer, product, and interaction event entities. In the end, of course, events, but first of all, entities. And so the customer is usually just one entity, sometimes broken up. If you really have, a, for example, a marketplace model where you really have very different customer types, yes, it can make sense to break it up into two, usually just one entity. And this is like your customer journey. So you define the activities, customer journey. So in product, it's basically the building box, blocks of your product or of your service. So like we really like the high level items. So for example, like a list, or like in the Jira case, the ticket and so on. So really like a high level entity where you then define all the activities, which usually describes like life cycle within this entity, what's happening. And then as a final layer, basically the interaction layer where you introduce a very generic structure that enables you to capture really granular interactions within your front ends, which are extremely helpful for PMs and UX designers to know but usually are not of interest for anyone else. So you basically create a place, a huge place, can be a lot of data in there, but it, you makes it, make it accessible and searchable for them to find the one that is interesting for them right now. So like this one specific CTA they want to know more about. So you basically introduce something which I call an explicit auto-tracking. And with this kind of structure, you can end up, let's say, with 30, 40 unique events with a lot of properties, which is fine, let's say 30 to 40 unique events, and this is manageable. This is something you can put into a tracking plan. This is something that you can monitor, and this is something that most of the people can then work with in the, let's say, in the environment wherever they work, like in Amplitude or in, in a data warehouse and then a BI tool, because the people just have 30 things to choose from when they want to create a report, and they don't have to go through 200 different events that they don't really understand to find the proper one to make an analysis. The user experience of this design improves a lot. I hope this is helpful. We will have other courses where you can then see how basically this looks like in practice. There is a course where I showcase the same approach here for Airbnb. And yeah, I hope this was a good start and I hope I got you a little bit interested in how to work with data collection and tracking design and see you in the next course.